So I am irrationally excited, perhaps, for this conversation today. It was 1986, an April night, Mike Smreck, at Old Chicago Stadium, and the Chicago Bulls were battling their way to try and make it into the NBA playoffs. This was the year that Jordan had broken his foot, missed 64 games, and the Bulls had a minutes restriction on them, and this night they had lifted the minute restriction, and I had forced my cousin or asked my cousin to take me to the Bulls game, and so we had seats behind the basket right uh, by where the Chicago Bulls would come out, and so before the game, I was like, I have to, you know, I'm going to try to get Jordan's autograph. And so I'm standing there with my pen and a ticket stub. And there was one Chicago Bull who stopped. And it was good old number 52 live today on the Windy. Uh, thank you for joining me. Mike Smreck, you signed my Bulls ticket stub, which if I still had, is probably worth a bunch of dough. Of course, I don't have it. So I think maybe a cup of coffee somewhere. Not at Starbucks, I, I, though. I, I, yeah, probably not. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. You would have got Michael's. It would have been worth something. Well, sure, but still history at old uh, the old stadium and a, and a night where uh, you guys ended up going to the playoffs and, and, and playing the Boston Celtics, of which you did not win a game, but uh, you did play. It was you were there for one of the most iconic uh, – games in the history of the NBA playoffs. I mean, still the, still the leading score in, in playoff history. Jordan was 63 in the garden. You were a rookie, by the way. Let's just, let's recap here. You were a second round pick for Portland. The Bulls traded you to get you. Do you have any idea who they gave up to, uh, to get Mike Smruck back in the day? I seem to remember it was like a ham sandwich and something else. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. It, it was Ben Coleman who went on to have a pretty decent NBA career, yeah. uh, play with the Nets. He was a big center. And yeah. Ken Johnson, who played in the league for one year. So you were traded for two players, by the way. Um, and here you came. You you played, by the way, you played your college ball, for those who don't know it, Canisius. Uh, and here you come, a second-round pick to Portland, the Bulls. Uh, Jerry Krause always loved centers, and he was bringing in uh, good old number fifty-two, one of it, one of his first moves. And here you were on a Bulls team, and I don't know. Do you remember the night that Jordan broke his foot in, in uh, against the Warriors? Does that ring a bell? I don't re remember the exact night, but I certainly remember, you know, the, the time around the year that uh, kind of when he did it. But I don't remember who we were playing at that time but I, I can remember him uh breaking it in fact i think uh, uh myself and charles oakley carried him off the court is that right that's yeah because you you know he's you, you he couldn't walk so you had you were carrying his legs wow i gotta go look at the picture of that that's that's one thing i missed in the research here that you and you and oak carried him off oak was a rookie you yes. were a rookie um and you had interesting veterans on this team. The Bulls in that offseason, they had traded David Greenwood, who you went on to actually play with with the Spurs down the line in 1989. Uh, um, they traded him for George Gervin, who was the highest paid bull on that team at $800,000. You were playing with the Iceman. Yeah, what, what a treat. You know, even now, I still – he is, is the absolute coolest – I mean, and I mean cool – He's the coolest person on the planet, I think. He just naturally – I really liked him. Yeah. Do, you you had Ice, Stan Albeck, young Jordan. Do you remember practicing against Mike? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> and What was that like? The thing that you remember about uh, Michael was that he, every second, whether it was practice or a game, he was all out the most competitive person and just went, he gave everything every second. Did he talk trash to you, Mike? Was he a respectful guy to the big man? Yeah, I, I had, he never said anything uh, bad towards me. I always, uh, you know, got along with him well. And, um, you know, he just, he was just very, very, very intense. Even as a second year guy. So uh, your rookie year, 
you you scored a career high or a season high that year of 15. Do you have any idea who you had it against? <laughs> I, you know, I didn't have many of those nights, so I do remember that. Who would you play? The Celtics. We were. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because I I didn't expect to play that night because I hadn't been playing really much, and um, when I got got there, I, I think. Uh, I don't know, Dave Corzine, whether he had a broken hand and uh, Juwan Oldham might have been sick or something. I can't remember quite what it was, but suddenly here I I was, uh, I don't know if I started or not, but I remember playing quite a bit that game. Yeah, and uh, would, it, would it warm your heart to know that you scored as many points that night as, as the great Larry Bird did? Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it just the small little glories I get to live with? Yeah, I mean, there, there's got to be some fun of that. You on that night, you, you and Bird went toe to toe, and 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 and, and you both had 15. I, I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I love that. Right? Come on, that's awesome. I'll take it. I'll, yeah, you know, I, at this point, I'll take it. Uh, I'm pulling. I, I want to actually double check here because you just you just made me curious um, if you got the start on that night or not. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it up here in one second. But uh, you you also like that that season. Um, you had you had Stan Albeck and you had the Bulls trying to hold Jordan back, and there was and and Michael is being pulled out of games as you guys are trying to make the playoffs and Stan's fighting with management, Jerry's trying to, you know, the Jerry Reinsdorf and Jerry Krause are thinking long-term Michael wants to play. Do you remember any, like any part of being in the middle of all that? No, as, as, as someone like myself, we didn't, uh, we weren't privy to any of those, like the back room conversations or what was going on. I mean, obviously on the bench, we knew Michael wanted to play him. We knew Stan wanted to play him, uh, but everything else we really you know, they did, we weren't told much. Yeah. And for the record, you came off the bench that night. It was 30 minutes off the bench, 15 points, 11 boards, by the way, three blocks, three assists, six for and 10 then, from the field, three of five at the foul line, 14,000 in attendance at Chicago Stadium. It's awesome. I don't think I played the next 10 games. <laughs> well, is <laughs> See now that that's not that's not good, Stan Albeck. Come on, man! Just showed that uh, you could do something, and then you and then you buried him. You you uh, you played. You scored two points the next night uh, in twenty minutes, and you got five minutes against uh, Atlanta. I mean, hey, we can it, forget it, about that. Stuff. We don't have to we, mention we, that. We, 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 yeah, I, I, I didn't mean yeah, to go we don't there. Don't mention those nights. What What do you remember about a young Charles Oakley? Oh, uh, tough. Just really confident and tough and a hard worker. I always, you know, even to this day, he's probably one of the players I respect uh, the most. Uh, he, he just, he worked so hard uh, and just such a competitor and, and just, he just believed in himself, you know, right, right from uh, the time when he was a rookie, he came in and he, you know, he didn't take anything from anybody. He just, he just believed in himself, worked hard and uh, what, what a great player he, you know, he was. And I, I got to rewind back too, because you know you're coming to the league from Canada. You're in the Canadian Basketball Hall of Fame, and you know you're seven two. So people of your size tend to perhaps gravitate towards basketball more than hockey. But how did you like? How did the basketball love come to be for you? It, it never did, to be honest with you. And uh, if I can just make one, I'm, I'm actually only six ten. I was always listed at seven two, but I. You know, <laughs> if we have a minute, I can explain to you how that happened. Yeah, it's, we have, it's quite we have, funny. Go ahead. At, at the pre-draft camps, the head of scouting at the time was a guy named Marty Blake. I uh, wasn't very tall. And when he would take your measurement, he had this stick. And sometimes he'd stand on the ground and the stick would go like this over. You, and it, it would it would go about two inches over your head. And he'd read that. And that would be your, your height. And another time he'd stand on the chair, it would be normal. So I guess the one time he did it, he had me about four inches taller than I than I am, which uh, it stuck. Did, did did you say, hey Marty? Uh... <laughs> I was just happy to be there. Yeah. I, I didn't care what they listed me at. But that that might have actually mattered a little bit, you know. I mean, I don't know. 
Uh, yeah, I, you know, I never really thought about that. I was just thought, kind of thought it was funny that I was, you know, listed that when I'm, you know, really only about, you know, six ten, maybe six ten and a half. Um, yeah. But back to the the part about loving basketball is funny because uh, it was something that just kind of fell into really. Uh, I think it was about sixteen or seventeen, maybe at, at high school, and the basketball coach w- was a teacher in one of the classes I had and, and I liked him as a person. And, and he asked me to come out for the team. And I didn't want to hurt his feelings by saying I didn't like basketball. So I, I decided I figured I, I would go out once or twice and then quit. But um, once I started, I, I, I honestly don't even know why I didn't uh, just something inside. Just, I didn't quit uh, and kept going. But um, I think towards the end of my career, I probably loved it more. But at that point, physically, you've already, you, you know, you're not what you used to be. Uh, but because I came to it very late, so I, I didn't, wasn't something that I loved. I grew up, I loved hockey. Yeah. yeah. How close did, how far were you able to take hockey? Not far, because where I live, we live, we live pretty far out of town on a farm. Uh, and okay. I, and the practices were in the morning in the city and I had, one, no way to get there. And two, I was working in the mornings before school. We had, we had a dairy herd of cattle and stuff. So um, it was about work at that time. So I didn't get to, I played, you know, pickup hockey with friends on the ponds and stuff like that, but I never got to play uh, that's, in the leagues. So work, learning work ethic at a very early age, you know, that's not nothing given there. I, I'm sure there was some value right, right there for you. Uh, let, let's move to year two. You leave Chicago. And I think according to, uh, what I read that you, the Celtics and the Lakers were both interested in you and you're like, screw you, Boston. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to this <laughs> California thing. I want to play with magic. Uh, I, no, I, I do remember the, the, the day and it was more, I think what my, my decision at the time was, I believe Bill Walton was coming back, uh, to the Celtics and I just, I thought, well, chances are they have Robert Parrish, Bill Walton coming back. They had a couple other guys. I said, I'm probably not going to really play at all. Didn't really consider that I probably wasn't going to play much behind Kareem either. I didn't think of that, but I uh, made the decision and uh, uh, ended up going out to L.A. Yeah, and so you're playing with Magic, Kareem, Worthy, Pat Riley, the – the 86 87 Lakers, some consider that the greatest team of all time. Uh, 65 wins. You had three losses in the playoffs. You stomped through uh, the Western Conference, one loss, and then you beat the Celtics in six. Um, I, I, you know, that, that had to be its own form of the Beatles, right? You're living out in LA and Magic and Cream, the whole thing. I mean, what was that like? That, that was an incredible, uh, incredible group of people to be able to be around. I very fortunate. Uh, probably, probably a week doesn't go by even now at this point in my life where I, where I don't think of those, uh, all those guys. And, um, a lot of the things that you I've carried with me that I learned just from the type of people that they are, you know, that you carry through your rest of your life. So the, it was, it was really special to, to see they're, 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 they were definitely, uh, very special individuals. I have something for you, Mike, that uh, you you might know where I'm going here, but we get to you can just sit back and and, and enjoy um, yourself back in. Well, I'm not sure if it was '87 or '88, but but here you were with 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 your Laker teammates. So just just t- take a little take a little enjoyment of uh, your talents. <laughs> I'm Kareem, the captain of the team. I don't need drugs. I got a higher thing. <laughs> All got to go. We got to learn to just say no. I'm Kareem, the captain of the team. I don't need drugs. I got a higher thing. My sky hook makes the team look good, but there's a hook we got to shake from the neighborhood. My name is Weston on the court. I'm rough. Out here on the street. We all got to get tough. Say no to drugs. Call the drug man's brother. You call me Smurf. Give my team my best. When you really care, you can do no less. But the game of life is more serious. The drugs make losers of all of us. There it is. Call me Spreck. Cause I, what was the actual words? I should have wrote them down. Call me Spreck because I'll do my best. Uh, something <laughs> like that, I think. Yeah, I don't know. It was a huge. Is there any royalties from that? 
<laughs> checks in the mail. I mean, you know, you heard it somewhere on the charts. Hey, like, you know, it was a big thing at the time, just say no. And, uh, you know, the eighties and, and Reagan and all that stuff. And so here you guys were, uh, but you, you did a rap, you did a rap video with the Lakers. Pretty amazing. Little did we know there'd be things like YouTube 30 years later, <laughs> come back to haunt us. Yeah. Kareem was an interest is an interesting guy, right? He, he, I mean, to this day, he's just he's a different cat. How, did you get along with him? What was your relationship like? I did. I, I got I got along with him. I I think quite well. I I, I have tremendous respect for him. I like him. Uh, I like him. And, and um, you know, I always considered uh, how long he'd been in the league. You know, how many people he'd seen come and go. The things that he went through in his life. Uh, at that time in the United States, that the, the things that he lived through and went through, and 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 the fact that he almost couldn't go anywhere without being bothered all the time. Um, so, you know that he he was a very very intelligent, very well read person, and very. Uh, I mean, you, you got to know just kind of when you know what his different moods were, and if you, if he was quiet one day, you just you didn't really. Uh, you just left him alone, kind of, you know. And um, other days he'd come in, he'd, he'd be more wanting to joke, and then you you could joke. But I always got along quite well with him. Yeah, so that that's interesting because that's exactly how I would imagine Kareem. Like, sometimes he would maybe give up the energy, like, "Don't bug me today. I've been doing this for a long time, and I've, I'm yeah. thinking about things other than basketball, and yeah. I'm here to do my job." And exactly. and then there's yeah. And then there's Irvin over there who, I mean, I'm assuming that when he comes in every day, it's kind of the same and he's just got energy. Is that about accurate? Yeah. Just what, you know, what you see with him is what, what, what he is. He's a, just a, just a tremendous spirit, you know, and um, he, he, he would be jovial all the time, but then when it came time to work, it was work, you know, it, that, you know, that side would go and he was all, all business at that point. But uh who who was the most vocal guy at practice for keeping things right on that team? Magic for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah he'd uh, he'd make sure. I, in fact, I guess to give you just a short story on that, I, I can recall one time we were on the road somewhere and we had delays with flights and buses and things, and we were supposed to practice when we got in, but we got in really late, and nobody nobody felt like practicing. Everybody was you know long day of travel, but we still went to the gym and. Magic made sure that it, even in the warm-ups, every time he made a layup, everybody had to clap. You had to clap. And next thing you know, the energy was building, and we had a fantastic practice. Uh, because of Magic, I mean, I'm sure he didn't feel like it when he first got there, but he knew what had to be done. And he got everybody's energy up. And if you weren't clapping, you might get a ball in the side of the head on a pass or something. But you – so you – you know, you – uh you carried your weight kind of thing and you did what you had to do. And uh, but magic was the, the spark on, on, on those days that got everybody going. So he, he was definitely the one that, you know, brought the energy. What was your strategy in trying to make it difficult on Kareem in practice? <laughs> you know, I think the big thing is I, I learned quickly that I, I'm not out there to try to prove that I'm ever going to be better than him. You know, it's, he, what all that he really needed was somebody to give him enough resistance so that he could stay sharp. Um, you don't, you don't go out there trying to hack him and foul him and, uh, you know, do crazy things. Cause like I said, you know, he's 20 years in the league. He's seen everybody come and go. Everybody's tried to stop him. You're not going to ever stop him. So you just try your best to put put enough resistance so that he has to, he has to work a bit to keep himself sharp. That's really what it uh, kind of came down to. You guys wanted, you know, as I just mentioned, easy in 87, but 88 was a battle and a half. And I, and I remember that Pat Riley said after you won in 87, we're, you know, at the, at the rally, the celebration afterwards, like we're coming back and we're doing it again next year, back to back. And like that just didn't happen at that point. The Sixers had their great season in 83. Uh, you guys won in 84. The Celtics uh, in 80, in 86. You in 87. It was always going back. So, like, nobody could go back to back. And then you guys 
went out and did it, but it was a slog through. Um, yeah. That 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 you and seven games with Dallas, yes. se- seven games with yeah. Utah. Young Carl Malone, young John Stockton, big yeah. man Mark Eaton, who I'm sure was not you know, uh, R.I.P. By the way, uh, great, great, yes. great, you know, yeah. fantastic, uh, just name in NBA history. Yeah. And and then you're you're down three two to the Pistons, and Isaiah puts up 43 in Game Six. You sneak out a win. And then the foul on Lambeer, and and uh, and you you win a very tight game seven. Yeah. That was that Detroit team. They got two titles. They could add a, a lot more. I would say that Detroit was a better team than you guys that year. But some, but there maybe had more experience is how I would put it. And to, to win it, how how do you look at it? Say exactly what what the difference is because it, it definitely like you're, you're right on. It was a grind right through. And and I know, you know, our main guys were really they were hurting. Their, you know, the Achilles, their knees, their back. They were, they were, they were held together with thread at the time. Um, so, and I, th- I think it's a combination of the personalities that you have with Kareem and Magic and James Worthy and uh, all those guys, and and uh, Pat Riley as well. Uh, as I said, they're they're really they're really special individuals, and with the abil- with their ability to almost do the impossible at times. And I think that's kind of what they what they tapped into at that time you know to to get that there was no denying that they were going to achieve it what was it like being a 20 some odd year old young man wearing playing for the lakers in la when you're winning championships that could not have that must not have sucked (laughs) i yeah it was you know i probably you know i probably didn't realize just what it was at the time because you know, honestly, growing up here watching hockey, I really didn't know a lot of the history with the, uh, even if, even being my, you know, at that point in the second year in the league, I didn't know the depth and the the history between a lot of these teams and the players. And uh, so I, I probably didn't fully appreciate, uh, I mean, I certainly appreciated, uh, you know, living there and doing that, being part of it. But I, I think now I understand more that I, I probably could have even enjoyed it more. Do you remember what kind of car you were driving? Do you remember if like were you a guy that would go out? Were you just focused on I got to win games and do you know even though I'm not playing a ton, but I got to stay focused. I mean, no, I, I was uh, I didn't I didn't go out a lot. I kind of w- would watch. You know, I would do a lot of watching. I, I was uh, and I, and I drove a truck. <laughs> I always had a truck. You know, I still do. Um, so I mean I, I would I would watch everything I would take and I would enjoy I mean I really did enjoy a lot but I I was more an observer of a lot because I I kind of I think I realized that you could get swallowed up pretty quickly in a lot of ways in that environment and you know I, I was pretty diligent I, I you know I tried to take care of myself and uh, you know eat right sleep right and work out as much as we had to with Pat Riley's practices. You uh, you couldn't uh, mess around. Those were the hardest things I've ever been through in my life. Is that right? Yeah. No. What well, well, like a Riley practice? What well, you're? I guess back in the day, I guess they three hours that type of stuff. Yes, and then you know, and then you had strength training afterwards or two. So you'd spend quite a bit of time, and it was a, a lot, tremendous amount of full court fast break, working on the fast break, in uh, a lot of just so much running you know the philosophy was we come in in shape and just outrun and get a jump in the beginning of the season jump out ahead 10 games in front of the while well, the other teams are kind of getting themselves in shape um so even coming into training camp again magic was part of this would make sure that you were in top condition coming in i mean you guys were scoring 117 points a night that was that was i mean second That's in the league these threes were being hit right Right, you weren't. I mean, I, I I'd have to go and look look it up, but I mean, three point shooters on the team is you know you had Coop, um, and I guess Byron could shoot it, but really, I mean, you didn't really have three shooters, three point shooters. Um, let's see here. We got uh, we got some people coming in on the chat here, Mike. Let's see. Uh, let's see. You playing against the eighty six else with the eighty seven? Okay, so he wants to know. If the 87 Lakers versus the 86 Celtics, wondering if you could compare the two teams, what do you got? Well, I, I mean, I have to always go with the Lakers, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, both obviously great teams, but 
I just knowing my teammates at the time, I, I I would always have to pick each one of those guys, you know, and I would have to say the you know the Lakers were the better the better team, um, and that's uh, you know I, I've listened to a few interviews with some of the players later talking about how the, how much animosity there was between some of them and then they, how they couldn't stand each other. And, um, but, you know, the, I think there was still a mutual respect still for how good, you know, you, all the players on the Celtics were as well. But I, I, I just think that the, the, the Laker team at that time, uh, and, and, it, and so much of it goes back to the, uh, the, in, the individuals like Kareem and Magic, and they, there was just, I mean, there's something special about them. I mean, as there was with Larry Bird, I'm sure too, but I didn't know him personally. I got to know personally uh, guys like Kareem, Magic, uh, Coop, uh, Byron Scott, AC Green, all of, all of those guys. And they each had, they're just, I think they're the type of people that almost no matter what they would have done in life, they would be tremendously success, successful. You don't remember any bird trash talking sitting on the bench or whatever being on the court hearing Larry ch chomping oh, yeah. something? Yeah, he didn't direct much at me, of course, even though, you know, I, I did score the same as him on that 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 Chicago night. <laughs> yeah. he, he seems to have forgotten it. Um, but, yeah, he well, he was he would talk with the best of them for sure. You know, and there, there was it was a lot of heat in those games. Did you did you ever have to match up against McHale? Probably at some point, uh, I, I probably did. Uh, generally, I would be against Parrish, but sometimes you get switched off or something happens. or So there'd be different times. And, you, uh, and I, I do remember at, at different points having to defend him. Because, I mean, Kareem, I guess, would – I mean, you had to guard him in practice, and uh, maybe else, I guess when you were around the league, maybe you matched up against him as well. But, like, that's – like guarding the Skyhawk, maybe the toughest thing to defend. But Kevin McHale, as far as pure moves in the post, yeah. very, very, it, you know, there, there's no one else in the league that has, has, has actually played that way. So that, I don't know how, how you would describe it. Just, just that way. His, he just had a, a way of, of kind of twisting and turning and getting under. And like he, you know, he had long arms. And uh, yeah, he was he, just the way he moved was so much different than every other player. He, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't a, like a big, heavy physical player that would knock you off your, your position, but he'd somehow almost like he was made of rubber sometimes. And he could, he could get up underneath and twist and turn and he, and he finished well, he finished very well. So very, well, very difficult player to, uh, to defend. Well, I remember in the 63 point game uh, with, with Mike and the Celtics, Bert I, and Mikhail had a shot sitting on Dave Corzine. I don't know if you remember, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember that moment at all? <laughs> you know, I don't remember that, but it, <laughs> it's it, funny because I still keep in touch with Dave. So, I, you know, Dave, Dave got the living bejesus boot out of him in Chicago. You weren't, but that was before you got there. And then Michael made him almost a, a fan favorite because you would get him open shots and, and Corzine could hit him. He so could. it, it, it changed. He's a good player. Yeah. 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 Um, here's another question for Simon. The best offensive play you ever had to defend. Wow. The heart. Uh, well, I think Carl Malone, I often had to defend Carl Malone to me. He was, it was a nightmare. I, I, I dreaded having to, to defend him. He was quick, strong, and he played from a position so low. Like the bigger centers, you could use your body, you can use your knees, your leg to try to push them off the block. Carl Malone would get down with his butt almost below your knees. And he was so strong and quick and explosive that he, you almost couldn't push him out of position. And, and, and he had very quick hands too. And he was just really hard to defend in the post. See, it's it's interesting because, you know, whatever. I grew up in Chicago, and so I wasn't watching Utah play every night. You know, this is a different era where you know Sports Center and ESPN and T the NBA and TNT wasn't there. But I never quite understood because I you know how he did it offensively because he didn't have like a signature move. Good shooter, but not elite. But you're you're explaining something else here where he just he I guess he knew how to use his body. Like I would say that about Barkley that. You know, well, he, well, he's very similar. You know, they were they were a, a smaller player. I didn't 
really have to guard him as much, but occasionally in the – like Carl didn't play in the post a, a whole lot but because uh, a lot of it was fast break with, with John Stockton. But in, in the post, really, really difficult to defend. Who was your least favorite Piston? Ah, oh, boy. <laughs> Don't be Hard afraid, Mike. I know. Yeah, yeah you know, I mean, I – I don't know. I, I don't know that I really thought about it that way, you know, to tell you the truth. Real, yeah, okay. There was no one that I really had a dislike for, you know, and maybe that was part of my problem. <laughs> I should have hated somebody. <laughs> uh, not, well, if you didn't hate Lambeer, that's interesting because that dude was straight hated. Um, a lot of guys did, but, you know, you know, what a career he had. Boy, you know, I mean, he did what he had to do, you know, just – Great player. Yeah. Yeah. There, well, no, no doubt. And he would have fit on many, many teams with oh, yeah. a guy that wants to defend, big man who can shoot it, um, yeah. still is an enormous pain in the ass. But uh, fair enough. Do you do you remember watching Isaiah in the game six and he's, he's hobbling around on one leg thinking, how the hell is this guy doing this? Oh, definitely. Yeah. We, I, he probably shouldn't even have been playing on that leg. But, again, somehow uh, – you know, some of these great, great players, they somehow seem to transcend the humanness that we have at times. And they're, and they're able to come and do these things like, I mean, what a, what a performance, you know, really basically on one leg. Yeah. So, all right, let's move on to, to 89. You go to San Antonio. So you're at, you were at the top of the NBA mountain and now you're back down where you were with the Bulls, a 21 win team. Larry yeah. Brown's the coach. Got a bunch of interesting names on that team, especially from like from a Chicago standpoint. You had Dallas Comages, who was a great yeah. player at DePaul. Uh, David Greenwood's on that team, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, Keith Smart, who hit uh, the game winner with Indiana in the in the national championship. You had a, and you had a a young Alvin Robertson. You're playing for Larry Brown. Um, by the way, you're high that year. You also had 15 versus Boston. I don't know if you remember that game. And then you had a couple 13 point games against uh, the Supersonics and, and, and Dallas. But so now this, that was the first time you ever really got a chance to play uh, some significant minutes, Mike. Yeah, it wasn't. I, I remember that year too. Unfortunately, I, I, I broke my, my foot and I was out for a good chunk of that year. Um, but I, I was, I mean, of course I was in, in a way sad to have left the Lakers, but I, I was looking at it as an opportunity to probably get some time and play. Um, I missed part of the season and then tried to, I guess, you know, I, whenever I had the chance, I tried to play, do, do whatever I could at that time. But there, there was there was some interesting people on the team for sure. So do you think most guys would rather play next to, you know, a handful of minutes here and there and be on, the, and, and be on a team like L.A. Or, or play 15 minutes a night and win 20 games? Well, I can speak for myself. And since I, I was fortunate enough to have – Two be on the two two uh, the back to back Lakers teams. I always say that I would I would take one year of winning one championship, and then have a year where I could trade and maybe have a a great year, a personal great year with another team somewhere, um, because it's it's as winning the championships with the Lakers were nice, but I I know I had a very limited role, and you live with that the rest of your life. I would love to have had one like even one or two fantastic years where I felt that I really reached and did the, you know, reached my potential kind of thing. Uh, and it had a, regardless of the number of wins, I think for that may sound a bit selfish maybe now, but um, you know, as, because once you, once you are done playing, you never, you're never going to get younger and go back and have a chance again. So uh, it would have been nice to have a year or two uh, uh, to really have a, a season that I could be totally satisfied with personally. Uh, so it sounds like the real bummer was the foot injury because here now you're getting a chance to play and, and, yeah. and get a little chance to show what you can do and then you get hurt and that just that just sucks it, it did because it was my uh the, the navicular in my in my foot so i was out for quite some time and then uh that didn't help you know? yeah 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 right when i mean the margin's so small and then you're dealing with, I, I get it i get yeah. it and you 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 end up with the warriors in 90 yeah. and that's don nelson another nba great and like the centers on that team, you had Minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had Uwe Blob, who was another just a 
great name. And then that was Run TMC. You had you know Hardaway, Mullen, and Richmond. Do you have any Minute stories? I mean, Minute, Minute is beloved in NBA circles. People just whenever that name comes up, everyone smiles. Well, you know what? He's a fantastic guy. What well, again? Um, R.I.P. Yeah. Rest in peace. Uh, but I, I loved him. He 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 was so funny, and he would like he just had the greatest sense of humor. And just a just a fantastic guy. I, I really I really enjoyed my time with that team. I loved that was probably the most fun that I've had was with with the Warriors. I, I absolutely loved playing with Don for Don Nelson, and and I loved all the guys were fantastic. They were just it was I, I remember that I couldn't wait to go to practice at that time. I, I just it, it was just so much fun. Explain Nelly a little bit. I mean, he's like into the weed now and hanging out in, in Hawaii and God bless him, like fish ties and just NBA legend, Don Nelson. Definitely. And, and I, and I loved him. I, I would, you know, he, he gave me an opportunity and that was all I could ask for. And um, it, I just, I, I think what he, what I loved about him was he gave me some confidence uh, you know, during practices, we would do different things. We would play one-on-one -on -one competitions with the whole team. So you'd go throughout the whole team, and he would really look and see what you could do. And he'd give you an, give you an, oppor an honest opportunity. And um, it, it, I just really, really enjoyed uh, playing for him. Yeah. Uh, practice, Tim Hardaway. I think he's – to me, underrated uh, all time, Hall of Famer in my mind. That guy was ridiculous. He, he was, and and when you look at spe especially at his size, he wasn't. I mean, he was a powerful, strong guy, but he wasn't yeah. all that big. But just a, a, a tremendous competitor, one. And then, but his skill level, like the way he could that crossover that he had, you know, was, uh, you know, I mean, players players today copied him. And, and then took it to another level, of course, again. But he was fantastic, and he could he could really play for sure. All those guys, man, Mitch Richmond, boy, and then Chris Mullen, you know. And then some other guys they had to fill in there were just fantastic players too. Yeah, with Hardaway, I mean, fast, strong, explosive. You had yeah. Sarunas Marshallonas on that team too, for the record. I don't know if you'd like yeah. – I'm not sure who you're naming in the rest of the roster that, that yeah. piques your interest. But uh, Oh, yeah, was... Sarunas. What, yeah, he sat right next to me in the locker room. And there, he, Him and I got along really well. And that guy had, had the absolute strongest hands and forearms of anybody in the league. I remember one time Clyde Drexler was was running down the lane full speed on a dribble, and, and, and Rooney just clamped the ball and, like, stopped him dead. This guy wow. was powerful. He was so strong. Unreal. <laughs> yeah. How, like, for those who don't quite understand it, and, like, you know, I'm a recreational basketball player my whole life and, you know, love the game, but, like, just to understand the athletic talent of the of the NBA and what that's – what these guys are like, like, how, like, how, how would you explain that? It's, it's that definitely sense. another level. It's um, – I think you, you almost have to uh, – <clears throat> experience it on the court with them in some ways to really because you know so they look they make it look so easy especially a lot of the guys now you know there's the, the athleticism and it, it looks easy but i think having been a player knowing how hard and how difficult it is to actually do some of these things that they're doing gives you even more appreciation um i, I was a decent athlete but what these guys you know what they're able to do is just it's it's a whole other level that i, I don't know that you can fully appreciate it unless, you know, if you had an opportunity to get out on the court and do it with them, you know, because yeah. you see them doing it against other guys of comparable level. But if you took someone, anybody off the street and brought them and put them on the floor, you would see just an unbelievable difference. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's just from a fan standpoint, like if, if you're sitting, you know, up in the 200 level, 300 level, and you're watching the game, it looks like one thing, but if you are fortunate enough to have a low down seat yeah. And and just see how fast and how big up and down the court, it's it's a, it's 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 I, for me that's like a, like a highlight sports viewing thing because it, it's such a rare um, like four steps and they're up and down up and yeah. down the court. I don't I I don't know. I'm I'm just yeah. getting geeked out on on basketball right now. I'll settle down. <laughs> 
Um, what was your second best sport, Mike? Because you were saying you were a good athlete, and I'm, I'm curious. Like, what else did you play? Well, you know, I, I, I still uh, when I when I stopped playing basketball, I, I kind of started playing pickup hockey with a group of guys here, and I, I, I just I was playing five days a week. You know, I, I love absolutely loved it. I, I think I, in my head, I was. Uh, I mean, at this point, I'm already in my late 30s. You know, but. Um, <laughs> I'm actually thinking, I wonder if I could be a two sport player and wonder if I can make it to the NHL, you know? And, uh, so, I mean, I was, I was doing, uh, there was a junior B team in Niagara Falls right near here. And I knew the owners and they would let me come to, and skate with them through every one of their practices. I would do all their skating drills, their puck handling drill. I do all of that. And then I'd play with my, my buddies in the pickup games. And I, I guess I, I have to say, I actually got fairly good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, had, I had a wicked wrist shot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, so I, I would have loved, I mean, uh, you know, these guys, I mean, the guys, same thing in the NHL. The guys are so good. I, I you know, it, it was a, certainly a fantasy, but, um, you know, that would have been yeah. my next sport. Yeah, no, I, I, hey, I, 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 I love that you were still wanting to compete afterwards and, 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 and enjoyed it. And you still play now or no? No. Body, body done. The feet and the knees and everything else just, you know, I, I still have to function on just in daily things. So I, you know, I can't, I can't really play anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. La last couple for you, just traveling in the NBA back then, like now they all have their own planes and charters. Any, any story stand out of, I don't know, walking through airports or just how, like, I'm just trying to remember like what it was like for you guys back then. Cause you're here you are. I mean, the bulls weren't the bulls at, at that point yet, but, and, but they, the Lakers were the Lakers. Yeah, it, it was so much different than it than it is now, for sure. I can remember, uh, you know, we'd go through airports and the people who were supposed to be watching the baggage going through were waiting to try to get Kareem and Magic's autograph. So you, you almost could have snuck anything you wanted through there, you know. And, and there was a couple a couple of stories. I, I don't even know if I should probably say them or not, but um, I think it's okay. Yeah, I can remember uh, one time traveling with. Uh, you know, being in Texas, you had you had to go to a shooting range at some point. You know, this is when I was in San Antonio, and I had a duffel bag and a, and a whole bunch of these little twenty-two shells had fallen out in my pocket of my bag, and I didn't know it. And I traveled the rest of the entire season with that bag, and was never never stopped at an airport. You know, at the end of the year, I dumped everything out, and I said, "Oh man," you know. <laughs> and then Frank Rakowski, who was a he used to collect. Um, antique guns and whatever and he didn't know it but his girlfriend had put a colt 45 in his somehow in a duffel bag or whatever and we're on the plane and he gets his luggage out of the carry-on rack and he opens it up and there's this pistol sitting right on top you know and we're on the plane flying already so, so back then everybody was looking for auto like now now you'd be, you wouldn't even get anywhere near the airport but yeah uh, some of that stuff when you look back on it you know, oh boy you know crazy y yep Yep. Different era for sure. Yeah. I, you know, you guys would, I just, you know, I look at the old videos and there's, you know, whatever I, you know, this is mainly the bull stuff, but like there's Michael and Scotty, they're in the airport waiting for a flight with United. They're playing cards. Like if you're a kid showing up there, like that's like the greatest moment ever. Um, even for an, I guess uh, not just a kid and an adult too. And back in those days too. And, and you, you practiced there. They used to practice at the multiplex, which was this open facility where anybody could go in and there they are. There's the bulls practicing and you can watch them practice. It's just such a, such a different time. Um, but Hey, Hey, this was really a ton of fun. I, 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 I appreciate the autograph. I, I wish I still had the stuff. Um, and I, I just remember you being like the friendliest guy too. You were you were just happy to do it, so which um, I don't know. You know it's, it's I was fun. very fortunate. I, I was, uh, you know, looking back, I was very fortunate in my life the way things uh, worked out. So I, I guess I have a lot of reason to have been happy. You know? Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing the competitive part about you, but I want to say, like, you made it to the NBA. You played seven years in the league. I mean, it's you're you know top one of one percent who got to do that. So. Uh, congratulations. I'm extremely jealous to the, to the end of the earth, along with a zillion other people that, you, you know, what you got to do. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I'm sorry that that autograph wouldn't have been worth a little more for you if you had it now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was not how I was thinking back then. So I, it was a, it was a cool moment to remember that. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Hey, 
Mike, I uh, hope, hope maybe we can talk some hoop down the line. Do you enjoy watching the game nowadays, by the way? You, the, the whole – I mean, the second I don't game watch just it. pushed out. I, I mean, if, if I'm somewhere and it's on, I will watch it. and I, 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 I keep up with it on the news and whatnot, but I don't really watch – you know, both my kids were in sports, so I, my whole focus shifted to, you know, my son was playing tennis and my daughter is playing volleyball now. So um, e everything shifted, and that was my focus, watching them. Your your daughter was is now at Wisconsin, I want to say, or at least was? Just finished her first year, and they won the national championship, and she got the MVP for the thing. So I, I, she's got she's got rings now. <laughs> my son's got rings, too. From, he won the Big East when he was playing tennis. Wow, at, at Marquette. So, so I so I get to enjoy them. Uh, I you know I started watching them, and that was where all my and now it's my son's finished, but um, my daughter's got three more years at Wisconsin. Does does mom get credit for half of this athletic ability, or was it all from dad? She has none. <laughs> <laughs> no, like from her side, her her brother played professionally in Greece for many years. Okay, uh, so he would you know he was. And her father was a, a water polo coach, so she has a big uh, background in sport as well. So, uh, in fact, it was it was probably her that got my daughter into volleyball. But uh, so I, I think we have to share, you know, well, some of that. That that sounds like a good marriage right there, fifty fifty. So, uh, Mike, great to catch up. Appreciate you taking time. And uh, yeah, yeah, let's uh, let's somehow do this again someday. I'd I'd love to. Keep we'll on get together with, story. with Billy because I would love to see him again too. So yeah, let's yeah, for sure. Uh, we I for those uh, you know good friend of Mike's is Billy McKinney who I do Northwestern stuff with. So that's how we got to you today, and uh, I appreciate Billy setting it up. So Mike, take care. Be great. All right. Thank you for having me, Mark. Our, my pleasure. My pleasure. Bye -bye.